Hello, good evening. Welcome to Northwest Tonight uh, with Roger Johnson. Wednesday evening, thank you very much for joining us. Our top story. This is inheritance money that a mother left her, so Viv is being penalised now for looking after her mum. Why a law aimed at recouping cash from criminals was used against Vivian, who spent years caring for her sick mother. The Department for Work and Pensions has defended its right to recoup benefits over payments, also tonight. Liverpool's cruise terminal is taken over by the world's biggest operator on a 50-year deal with big plans for the future. Childhood obesity, the reason that some kids are now getting conditions more common in middle age. After millions of steps up, John is stepping down. The man who climbed Helvellyn daily retires after 16 years. And over the next few days, we're going to see some brighter, some sunnier spells and temperatures on the rise, especially by Saturday, but it will come with some very strong winds. I'll have all the details at the end of the programme. So Vivian Groom from Cheshire cared for her mother in her final years and today she was in court to see the government take all the money that her mum left her using a law which is designed to recoup money from drug dealers and gangsters. Vivian's been prosecuted because she'd been overpaid carer's allowance but the Department for Work and Pensions has been criticised by MPs for failing to spot the overpayments and then, in the MPs' words, bullying and harassing those people who'd received them. As Phil McCann reports, Vivian is far from alone. Vivian Groom cared for her mum and ended up in court. The reason? She took a minimum wage job here at her local co-op in Tarvin, near Chester. She should have told the Department for Work and Pensions, the DWP, about it because she was claiming carer's allowance. She didn't because she says a social worker told her she didn't have to. Today in court, she was told she'd have to pay £16,000 back. I followed that lady's rules and, you know, I looked after well, my mum. We were paying it back and then yeah. the CPS decided to prosecute yeah. Yeah. and they've took everything. The DWP wanted to seize £16,000 that Vivian had been left in her inheritance, but could only do so if she was prosecuted. So, she was. And, with no legal representation, she pleaded guilty to benefit fraud. At the hearing here last year, a different judge reportedly told Mrs Groom, you were doing the best you could for your mother. You were making just sufficient money, he said, to live a normal life. He added that he was truly unimpressed with the way the Department for Work and Pensions had handled the case. This is inheritance money that her mother left her, so Viv is being penalised now for looking after her mum. Yeah. But for years, the Carers Allowance Unit, based here in Preston, has had the ability to spot most of these overpayments before they accumulate. They're not doing that, though, according to this DWP employee, who's speaking to us anonymously because he says he wants to blow the whistle. From 2014 onwards, really, they had no excuse for having these overpayments carry on for longer than two or three months, if they're investigating all of the alerts. Benefit staff get automatic alerts from HMRC if a Carers Allowance claimant is earning too much to claim. DWP should be protecting these people from getting into trouble with their benefits, but instead they're persecuting them and treating them like hardened criminals, using the Proceeds of Crime Act against them. It's appalling. That's the law that was used here today to get all of Vivian's inheritance. It's despite this report by MPs five years ago, which accused the DWP of bullying and harassing those who've been overpaid. Around 44% of people who care for people for over 35 hours a week are living in poverty. So to then receive a, bit, a large bill for an overpayment that they haven't been aware of, in lots of cases, that can be devastating for people. Vivian told me she originally thought she was the only one this had happened to. In fact, she's part of a long list. Phil McCann reporting there, he's here, as you can see. Thousands of people are in this position with overpayments, aren't they, of carer's allowance, and some of them for pretty big amounts. Yeah, as we can see, the DWP just last year revealed that uh, for 145, well, there were 145,500 overpayments of carer's allowance that they were looking to recover. 11,500 of them over that amount were for between 5,000 and 20,000 pounds. Like with Vivian, 270 were worth over 20,000 pounds. The DWP, as we heard there, have the ability to spot um, when this happens uh, so that it can stop reaching such huge amounts. Those MPs that criticise this 
this last year, five years ago. So the DWP had culpability for the majority of the very large amounts outstanding and that they should consider writing off amounts where the claimant had made an error given how complex the rules are. Now we've had a statement, as you'd imagine, from the DWP this afternoon. Uh, they say that they're committed to fairness in the welfare system while protecting the public purse. Claimants, they say, have a responsibility to inform them of any changes in their circumstance that could impact on uh, their ability to receive the benefit. They say it's right that we recover taxpayers' money when this has not occurred. OK, Phil, thank you very much. Thanks, Phil. Next tonight, Liverpool's cruise terminal is to be taken over by the world's largest cruise port operator in a 50-year deal. Global Ports Holding plans to invest up to £25 million in the port, doubling its operations with a new terminal building. The cruise industry is big business. It's the fastest growing sector in global tourism, as our Merseyside reporter Andy Gill has been finding out. Since opening in 2007, the Liverpool cruise terminal has seen 800 ships and a million passengers pass through. The council managed it from the start, but has wanted to hand it over to a private operator so it can spend the half million pounds a year it costs to run the terminal on other things. Now's the time to look at you know, other areas where we can, you know, like the knowledge economy and, and life sciences and other parts of the economy that we can stimulate and, and, and bring forward investment in that way. Now the council's handed back control of the terminal to Peel Ports, who run all of Liverpool docks. And it, in turn, has signed a 50-year deal with Global Ports Holdings to expand and improve the terminal. This was the time, um, the right point, in order to bring in a Global Ports operator to take it to its next level. And that's through its investment um, and also what they've done elsewhere in the world. Global Port Holdings describes itself as the biggest independent cruise port operator in the world. It runs terminals in Singapore, Portugal, the Caribbean and Turkey, for example. So why invest in Liverpool? It is very crucial that the city offers enough destinations, whether it's a museum, whether it's a soccer team, which is very important, the stadium and all those things. And Liverpool has all those things. The company that's taking over the cruise terminal need to get the right permissions from the maritime authorities to carry out this work. But if and when they do, they want to double the length of this pontoon, allowing two cruise ships in at once. That would mean 7,000 passengers a day coming through here. One travel expert says Liverpool could become to sea travel what Manchester is to air travel. Just as Manchester is absolutely the hub for aviation for Northern Britain, so Liverpool Cruise Terminal could become the maritime gateway. It's impossible to understate just how important cruising is. It's a constantly expanding part of the travel industry. The new operator also wants to build a new terminal building with shops and restaurants open to residents as well as travellers. Once the new work's completed, and there's no timetable on that yet, there could be nearly a third of a million passengers a year coming here. Andy Gill, BBC Northwest Tonight, Liverpool. Now, the death of a teenager treated by a surgeon who was found to have failed patients in his care is being reviewed by police after a request from the coroner. Catherine O'Connor died from a massive blood loss during an operation on her spine. She was treated by John Bradley Williamson at Salford Royal Hospital in 2007. Mr Williamson says that he has always made patient care his first priority. Network Rail says the furnace line in Cumbria, which was closed after a derailment last month, won't reopen until the end of April. A rail replacement bus service is currently operating on the route, which links Barrow and Lancaster along the Cumbrian coast. Now, diabetes, sleep apnea, liver issues, they're normally conditions which are associated with middle age or even older people. But now, alarmingly, a leading paediatrician has told us they are, they are becoming more common in children, and it's all down to obesity. Here, a third of children, aged 10 and 11, are classified as obese. And Alderhey Hospital in Liverpool was one of the first in the country to open a clinic to deal with the problems caused by excess weight. And our health correspondent, Jill Dummigan, has been given exclusive access to it. Ten-year-olds getting diagnosed with diabetes, sleep apnea, needing uh, breathing support at home. We had patients who had uh, severe liver issues. Those things would have been unheard of a um, few decades ago, and this is becoming more and more common. In Alderhey Hospital, doctors are becoming increasingly used to treating children for conditions formerly only seen in the middle-aged and elderly. 
there's a very rare complication. Now um, more and more children uh, do seem to have something called intracranial hypertension, where they have high pressure within the brain. And these children will need a procedure to drain the fluid from the back of the uh, body, uh, doing a lumbar puncture, or sometimes you'll have to get our neurosurgical colleagues to do a procedure in them to drain the fluid. And all of this caused by excess weight. Around 10% of the children who come to this clinic end up being admitted to hospital. The average weight of a child seen here is 120 kilos, nearly 19 stone. This clinic was set up in 2021. It was one of the first in the country and it's currently helping around 200 children. But the level of demand so great, there's another 100 on the waiting list. Her heart health was poor. She had a fatty liver. Her cholesterol was high. I don't think her kidneys were working properly, so inside she wasn't doing very well. This mum and her teenage daughter, who were calling Nicola and Naomi, have been with the outpatient clinic since the beginning. Naomi's body produces too much cortisol, and that makes her crave fatty and sugary foods. She's now on medication to suppress those cravings, and Nicola, whose words have been revoiced, says it's working well. She's done great. She feels fuller when she's eating, so eats a lot less. And you were saying that her health's a lot better as well? Yep, so all her health problems inside that I just mentioned, they're all fine, on the normal range now. Naomi also has autism and sensory issues with food. Around 30% of the children who come here are on the autism spectrum. Another 10% have ADHD or another learning difficulty. But the issue of children being dangerously overweight is now widespread. Nationally, nearly one in four children aged 10 to 11 years is now classed as obese. In Knowsley, that percentage is nearly one in three, the highest in the country, while in Manchester, Liverpool and Halton, the figures are only slightly lower. Clinics like this can make a huge difference. The good thing is all these complications are reversible once the weight comes down. So supporting that as a whole, in addition to lifestyle, becomes important. You need the range of professionals from dietitians, psychologists, physiotherapists, social worker, everyone to come together, provide the right support for their family. But at the root of much of this is poverty and lack of access to or money for healthy food and exercise. Nicola, Naomi's mum, says she cooks everything from scratch with healthy ingredients. But as a single mum on a restricted income, she knows how much easier and cheaper the fast food option can be. What do you want people watching this to think when they hear this interview? I guess not to be so judgmental if they see a child who's overweight or obese. They just think, oh, they overeat or they binge eat or the parents don't feed them properly. But that's not always the case. The hospital's now looking at increasing outpatient provision. Jill Dunnigan, BBC Northwest Tonight, Liverpool. Now, Brianna Jai's mum says that she hopes classes in mindfulness at Brianna's old school will help the pupils to deal with her death. Esther Jai is campaigning to train teachers in techniques to relieve stress and anxiety following Brianna's murder in a Warrington Park last year. Katie Barnfield was invited to Birchwood Community High School to watch one of the lessons. Close your eyes and now I'd like you to use your mind's eye to find any traces of tension. This lesson is a little different to normal. Are our teeth clamped together? And if they are, simply release it. Instead of maths or English, these year sevens are learning mindfulness techniques. What's it like when you're doing it? I was tired afterwards, very. It calms you down. I have bad insomnia and I, this will help. It was very relaxing and peaceful. I do have a bit of stress quite often. Say if you know, something stressful is happening in that soon or if there's a big crowd around you, to close your eyes, take a couple of deep breaths and then it can all just go away. Birchwood Community High was Brianna Jai's school before she lost her life in a brutal murder after being lured to a park in Warrington just over a year ago. Her mum Esther has relied on mindfulness to help her cope with her grief. I think it will benefit the children absolutely massively. I think that what happens to Brianna will have caused some trauma for the, for the children and for the teachers as well. So the fact that Emma's working so hard getting mindfulness into this school, um, it, it speaks volumes for Emma as a head teacher. What is mindfulness for people who might not know? The simplest way of saying it is present moment awareness. If something's just happened, I'm going to react to it. So if I react to it mindfully, I'm more likely to have a more peaceful outcome. Five minutes a day. 
As well as group sessions like this, Russell has so far trained 20 teachers and staff at Birchwood High in mindfulness, so they can keep passing the skills on to their own pupils. They've come up to us afterwards and said, oh, I used that, you know, I was getting really angry and I sat down and I did a body scan. So, so some of the strategies that we've used, they, they're coming back to tell us that they're starting to use those themselves. Head teacher Emma Mills says by September, she wants to have mindfulness built into the school's daily timetable. There's been, you know, a spike in, in mental health concerns across young people and, you know, we're not immune to that um, in Birchwood. The things that we used to do in school, maybe we need to change because, because time has changed, society has changed, life experiences have changed. <laughs> Emma is also working with Esther on her campaign, Peace in Mind which has so far raised over £85,000, aiming to train one teacher in mindfulness in every school in the country. If we can make a change and make things better for young people and their mental health, and I suppose not only for young people, but the families as well, um, then for me, that is, like it's, it's Brianna living on, and um, it means that her death wasn't for nothing then. Katie Barnfield, BBC Northwest Tonight in Warrington. Some of the good work being done in Brianna's memory. Now, uh, you might recognise this. I've been up Helvellyn in the Lake District once or twice over the years. In fact, I took that photograph of Striding Edge. It's a bit amateurish, I admit. But uh, few people, if any, certainly not me, have done it as, ma as many times as the guy we're about to meet. His name's John Bennett. He's one of the fell top assessors for the National Park Authority. He's gone up the mountain every day in the winter and spring to check the conditions for walkers, and he's done it over the course of the last 16 years. He's been up it about 778 times, he's been counting. But now, at the age of 61, John is hanging up his boots, as Steph Gleesby reports. The 61-year-old is one of a three-person team whose daily ascent to the summit provides invaluable information to walkers. Every day from December until Easter Monday, the team records temperatures, wind speed, chill and direction, and recommends the equipment walkers will need in adverse conditions to keep them safe. The job requires setting off in all weather conditions. You don't mind the weather changing when you're out, but when you actually have to start off when it's pouring down with rain, you need a bit more motivation, I think, sometimes to do that. So um, I've decided it's definitely time to let somebody younger do it. In retirement, John's lifelong passion for the fells will continue, but he admits he'll be doing it in finer weather. The hill is beginning to get a little bit steeper with the uh, advancing years. Uh, plus the fact I'm also getting a rather softer in my old age, and um, I now want to go up the hills on nice, bright, sunny days, as opposed to going up on days when there's horizontal snow, horizontal hail, wind. The job will soon be advertised by the Lake District National Park Authority. Right, let's move on to sport. Ian is here. Uh, big week in the Premier League, full fixture list midweek, mm -hmm. uh, business end of the season and uh, lots to play for at the top and at the bottom for our teams. Uh, yeah, third place Manchester City and Arsenal, who was second, played out that fairly uh, bland goalless draw at the weekend that was of most benefit to the leaders, Liverpool. It means City are three points behind the Reds going into tonight's home game against Aston Villa, with manager Pep Guardiola having to defend star striker Erling Haaland at his pre-match press conference after Sky Pundit, Manchester United legend and former manager Roy Keane called Haaland's general play so poor and almost like a League Two player. I'm not agree with him. Absolutely not. It's like he said, he's a manager for the second or third league. I don't think so. So, he's a, the best striker in the world. He didn't like that, did he? City v Villa kicks off at 8.15 tonight. There's full match commentary on BBC Radio Manchester. Now, as you'll probably know, darts has had a popularity surge since Warrington's teenage sensation Luke Littler reached the World Championship final recently. Tomorrow, he's in action on night 10 of Premier League darts at Manchester's AO Arena. And he won't be the only North West player on home turf. For Stockport's Nathan Aspinall, the world match play champion, it means an emotional homecoming, as he told me earlier. Last year, huge reception. How excited are you this time round? Oh, can't wait. You know, last year, 
it's something that I've always dreamed of. Yeah, we're really looking forward to it. I think the walk on is going to be absolutely off the charts and my fellow Manx are going to bring it home and make it the best ever, I think. All that and bullseye on the telly and now it seems it's approaching similar levels. Oh, it's been amazing for the game. You know, we sat here talking to you, BBC, that wouldn't have happened 12 months ago, let's be quite honest with you. So um, we are noticing a massive increase in, I don't, don't like using the word, but fame. Um, you know, your Instagram followers are going through the roof. He's a dart player, you know what I mean? That's football level. We were supposed to be speaking to Luke Little today, but his management have said he's got too much on this morning. Do you think that's sensible that his management are saying, look, he's got so many interviews, let's take a step back and give him a bit of space. He is still so young. Well, I'm doing the same amount of interviews as him today, but my manager's not said that. And it's the same manager, so I'm glad you told me that, because I'll be having words with him after this. <laughs> um, yeah, it's tough, but I think in a few years' time, when he doesn't have to get a mortgage and he buys an house, I think he'd be thankful of all these uh, interviews. And Nathan's thankful not just for his sporting success, but also that of his team Stockport County, who were four points clear at the top of League Two. Really buzzing for the lads. They're actually coming to the darts on Thursday night. So, yeah, I hope for, for the town of Stockport and um, obviously all the lads involved, I hope they go up and uh, I'm pretty confident they will. There you go. Darts is well cool again, Rog. Much like me and you. <laughs> <laughs> on the BBC. I know. In interviewed by Ian Haslam as well. Yeah, he's really made it. Thanks, Ian. Now then, just before the weather with Simon, uh, this Lancashire schoolboy in the tank turret behind me had a wish come true after becoming an honorary sergeant in the Royal Tank Regiment for the day. His name's 11-year-old uh, Noah Wilson. He's got a complex lung condition and the charity Make-A-Wish teamed up with the Army to give him a day to remember on Salisbury Plain. Miranda Shunk reports. Welcomed with a guard of honour, Noah Wilsden was expecting a quick tour of the Royal Tank Regiment, but little did he know what was in store. Kitted out with his own uniform and given the rank of sergeant was just the start of his wish to be a soldier for a day. The 11-year-old from Leyland in Lancashire lives with an undiagnosed complex lung condition. It's meant many treatments and visits to hospital as he deals with the critical illness. What this is, is something money can't buy. Through everything he's been through, has always been something that he's gone back to, watching videos, playing with guns, getting his camo on in the front room, and this is bringing it all to life and it's extra special. And where better to put all this training into practice than on Salisbury Plain, out on exercise? This is hugely special. It's a really unique uh, opportunity and moment. Uh, I couldn't tell you any occasion where something like this has been put on. We, have, as a regiment, felt like we had to do our all to give them the best uh, day out that we could. So much better than they imagined. I really didn't think it would be this brilliant. I love it so much. I think I might be quite popular, maybe. And I'm uh, quite excited to tell my friends. Miranda Shunker, BBC Northwest Tonight, Salisbury Plain. Oh, what a great day for him. Right, let's have a look at the weather. Simon's here. Roger, thanks so much indeed. Yeah, we've got some pretty wet and windy weather on its way over the next couple of days. Not good news, of course. The ground is already very soggy uh, for many of us. We've had a lot of rainfall throughout March and so far this April as well with plenty of showers. It's because low pressure is in charge of our weather. And as we go through Thursday, Friday, into the weekend, we've got further bouts of low pressure moving its way in from the southwest, giving us some heavy rain, but also some strong winds and much warmer air actually. We'll see by Friday and into Saturday, temperatures will be rising above the average for the time of year, but it may be counterbalanced because of the wind and the potential rain as well. So for the rest of tonight, well, we're gonna see quite cloudy skies, perhaps one or two spots of rain, but largely quite cloudy, little really going on overnight with temperatures getting down to about six or seven degrees Celsius. So Thursday morning, starting off on a rather cloudy note, we'll see lots of dry weather around on Thursday actually, but there's a potential for a bit of uh, rain just affecting the far south and east, just around the South Pennines. Some sunny spells developing into the afternoon and maximum temperatures getting up to around about 12 to 14 degrees. Late in the day, we will start to see some outbreaks of rain starting to move its way in from the southwest. And that's all associated with that weather system, which will continue to move its way north and eastward as we go into Friday. But then during Friday, there'll be some sunny spells, one or two showers in the sunny spells, though it will feel really quite warm. As I said, temperatures 15 to 17 degrees.
It's not too bad, is it? But it's so soggy underfoot. Yes, still. it is. And there is more rain to come, so yeah. that's not great news. No, absolutely. Um, Simon, thank you very much indeed. Uh, that's it from us for now. I'm back with the late news. Simon will be here as well, actually, half past <laughs> ten. Uh, but in the meantime, thanks so much for watching. Have a great evening. Good night. Bye.